will begin us this morning and try to keep us on schedule. And in doing so, I, I, I get to introduce uh, another person who has become a friend who was, well, I'll tell you the story. Back in 2009, uh, Mo Lane at Red State heard of a candidate who was running for governor in South Carolina. And he emailed me and said, we should have this person at this event we're doing in Atlanta. So we did. And it, she was amazing. And we endorsed her and we supported her. And Christmas of 2009, she called me at home and she said, we got a problem. Our fundraising isn't doing what we need it to do. And we're struggling. This was a five or six way primary. And I said, I'll see what we can do. And so over the Christmas holidays, the Christmas holidays in 2009, every single day we put up a post at Red State saying, this is who you need to support in South Carolina, give money. And her campaign manager, Tim, called me and said, I don't want to tell you to stop doing this, but we can't actually get her out of the office because she's just staring at the computer watching the campaign dollars come in. And so can you like not do it for a day so we can get her in the field? She became the governor of South Carolina. I had the honor of standing outside the state capitol in South Carolina when Sarah Palin endorsed her. And now she's running for re-election. And we're going to get her re-elected. Now, Governor Perry the other night referred to her as an island governor off the eastern seaboard of Texas. I refer to her as the governor of the state next to mine that we go vacation in because they've got better beaches. She's also a, a, a friend. Her husband is in the military, and sometimes she is in the interesting role of being a full-time mom and the full-time governor of an awesome state while her husband is keeping us free overseas. And I... I and... When she's not fighting for re-election and not being a mom and a wife, she's fighting the unions in South Carolina who are trying to come into the state. So I'm not just introducing to you guys the governor of South Carolina, I'm introducing my friend, Nikki Haley. Thank you very much, thank you. It's great to be home, it really is, because that's what Red State feels like. And I know that um, Eric was talking about when the fundraising was going on, I was sitting in the office going, $50 from Texas, you know, $25 from Florida, and it was just fun to see it all come through. And you know, I look back and know that when we really were going through that tough race, you were there. You were there and you didn't let up, even though no one knew who we were. No one knew why we were running. No one said we could win, um, but you stuck with us. And so I will always be, be grateful and continue to come to these red state conventions to say thank you. So as we look at what is happening in South Carolina, if you remember my story, I always said I'm the proud daughter of Indian parents that reminded us every day how blessed we were to live in this country. They loved the fact that only in this country could you be anything you wanted to be and nothing could get in your way. So now when I go past the TV or I listen on the radio or I read an article and they say that the American dream is dead, it's sad because I look back and I know what my parents wanted for their four kids. I know what my husband fights for when he goes overseas. I know what that dream means but also know we have to fight for it. And I'll give you an example. In South Carolina, when we became governor in 2011, we had a terrible situation. The economy was bad. There were a lot of people out of work. What I knew was if we could find a person a job, we could take care of a family. And we had a lot of families to take care of. At its height, our unemployment in 2011 was 11.1%. So we hunkered down and I said, we need, to get to the, we need to get into the customer service business. 
We quickly told every director of every agency, if you are costing a person or a business time, then you are costing them money and that is no longer acceptable in the state of South Carolina. We went further and we looked at our permitting department where things had gone to die. We replaced everybody off the permitting board, put all business people on that board, and the chairman of that board is the president of a construction company. We told all state employees they needed to start answering the phones. It's a great day in South Carolina. How may I help you? They hated that. They really did. But the point of it was we wanted them to be proud of where they worked. But more importantly, we wanted to remind them who it was they worked for. Their job was to answer that question on the other side of the line, solve that problem, get that person to a resolution. And then we said, if we're going to lift up South Carolina, we have to lift up all of South Carolina, even the rural areas. So we went to our Depart Department of Commerce and we said, okay, you get bonuses every time you close a project. This time, we're going to give you higher bonuses if you close it in a rural area than if you close it in an urban area. And magic happened. We looked at the business climate and we saw that we were the only state in the Southeast that did not cap damages for lawsuits. We quickly hunkered down with our legislature. We told them they were either for businesses or for trial lawyers. We passed tort reform, and we were back up with everybody else in the Southeast. And then we started to sell. And I am proud to tell you that that 11.1% unemployment rate in 2011 is now 5.3% today. We have dropped more than any other state in the country, but the part that I love is we now have more people working in the state of South Carolina than ever in the history of the state. We build planes with Boeing. We are now the number one BMW producing plant in the world. We're now the number one tire producing state in the country with Bridgestone, Michelin. We've added on Continental and we just brought on GT Tire. And if you've heard about carbon fiber, we've got it. The largest carbon fiber producer in the world, Torrey Industries out of Japan, is now calling South Carolina home. Over 57,000 jobs in our small state of South Carolina. And do I have to tell you, they're all non-union jobs in the state of South Carolina. I have said for a long time, I wear heels. It's not a fashion statement. We're kicking out those unions every chance we get. So you look at that, we now have the fastest growing economy on the East Coast. We're one of the fastest growing economies in the country. We are looking at the fact that South Carolina is on fire. And so as we've done that over these three and a half years, what I will continue to tell you though, is the hardest part of my job continues to be the federal government each and every day because every time we move the ball forward, they move it back. But we have hope. So when they talk about the American dream, think back. Obamacare, we were all nervous. We all didn't like it. South Carolina did not take the state exchange and we said no to the Medicaid expansions. But with Obamacare, we all fought. And think about how we fought. If the governors had not said no to the state exchanges, there would not have been a federal exchange. And now the courts have said the federal exchange is not legal. That's because the governors stood up and fight. We fought in South Carolina, governors across the country fought. That's how we will beat Obamacare. That's why it will fall under its own weight. And now you're looking at this immigration crisis. On one side, you are seeing that these children are put in dangerous situations by being incentivized across the border. On the other side, you're looking at states that have no idea what is going on. So I called Secretary Johnson myself, and I said, I need to know exactly what is happening in the state of South Carolina. And he said, well, we can't quite tell you that because of privacy reasons. <laughs> and he said, but I can tell you, we don't plan a shelter right now, and we don't plan any of the military installations. And I said, well, I and every governor in this country deserve to know exactly how many you are bringing into our state. And this is what he said. When these kids come to the border, they have a phone number sewn in their pants or a piece of paper in their pocket. They take that phone number and they ask the child who they know, and they go place that child with a sponsor. 
My question was, is the sponsor legal? And they said, sometimes, sometimes not. But don't worry, because when we place this undocumented child with this sponsor, they have to appear at a hearing. <laughs> now, do you really think that one of these minors is going to, that's staying with an undocumented sponsor, that that undocumented sponsor is going to show up at a hearing? No, they're not going to show up at a hearing. And so what we now know in South Carolina is 350 undocumented minors have come into South Carolina. They won't tell us who they are. They won't tell us where they are. They won't tell us what age they are. And they won't tell us who they're staying with. All out of privacy laws. That's what the federal government continues to do to us. And leadership is hard. But President Obama never should have let Congress go home without solving this illegal immigration situation. And that lack of leadership is what continues to cause this country problems and continues to make the governors have to fight even harder. But as governors, it's also our job to get creative. It's also our job to say that we're not going to be the victims. We're going to make it mean something. And we saw that when we were dealing with welfare. Everybody in the state was being negative about welfare. Why am I paying for that person on the couch? Why are they not doing something to help themselves? And so we tested it. So what Washington says is when somebody comes into the welfare office, check the boxes and hand them a check. But now in South Carolina, when somebody comes into the welfare offices, we check the boxes and we say, what do you do? What are you good at? What's your skill set? We have taken that information, matched it up with businesses, and to date have almost 25,000 people we have taken off of welfare and put in a job. In my great state of South Carolina, my agency directors understand the goal is never to give a check. The focus is always to find them a job. So when anybody tells you that the American dream is dead, I want you to think about South Carolina. Because I know my parents today know they made the right decision. They know they made the right decision to decide to raise their children in South Carolina in a country where they knew everything was possible. Everything will continue to be possible. But we have to fight for it. We have to be committed to it. And we have to remember not to back down every single day. And if we do that, and we will do that, we will win again. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I believe we are opening it up for questions. Yes, sir. Here's a Ten microphone. Years, Nikki Haley, 2016. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I am trying to survive South Carolina right now. You know, we have an election in November, and interestingly enough, I have upset two groups. One is the trial lawyers, and one is the unions. So we will sit there and. Uh, they're coming after us, but we're going to continue to fight. We've got a good story to tell. What I can tell you, though, that I think is very important is, first of all, let's not forget 2014. As we look at 2014, these governor's races, these Senate races all matter because they'll set the tone for 2016. And then as we go into 2016, let's remember the mistakes we made because that's the important part to make sure we don't repeat them again. I still bleed for the fact that we lost that last election. But what I can tell you is looking back, me included, I thought, along with everybody else, that if we shot at President Obama's record enough, it was so bad, if we showed the American public how bad it was, that we would be okay. But the problem was we never talked about what we were for. We never talked about what we would do with the debt. We never talked about what we would do with jobs. We never talked about how we would go and improve this country and get us back on our feet. And we have to remember that we are always the group that talks about solutions. It's not just about saying no. It's about saying what we do say yes to. And that's where we have to go in 2016.
Uh, this is going to seem like a petty question. My name is Jane Trammell. I'm in Georgia. Um, I don't have to make this trip anymore, but I used to drive from uh, Atlanta to Charlotte and uh, got three tickets in South Carolina. Thank you. On <laughs> but what has always bothered me is I'm legal carrying my gun in Georgia. I'm legal carrying it in North Carolina. But when I drive through South Carolina, I'm not legal. Uh, and I don't understand that. I mean, it's, to me, it's just absolutely absurd that I can't drive from two southern states and have one there in the center that says I can't have a gun. I'm not going to go out and shoot anybody in that state. So I can just drive it through. Right. Well, and that's a great question. First of all, I'm a CWP member myself um, and a carrier, so I can totally relate to how we want you to be able to carry when you come through South Carolina. We just um, won and passed a bill this year that now allows um, gun owners to be able to carry in restaurants, which was something that had not happened before. So we've done that. Because we changed what those laws are, they're now looking to see how we can make sure that reciprocity happens in other states. So you can rest assured that our goal is to make sure that anybody that visits South Carolina is very comfortable visiting South Carolina and very comfortable in carrying. Governor Haley, first of all, thank you so much for um, when you came to the Red State Gathering in Austin several years ago, I expressed concern that my parents, who live in Sun City in Bluffton, South Carolina, just weren't getting the message. And there were so many people in their community that just didn't know about you and weren't involved. And I just said, what can we do? Well, you went there two or three times, I believe, before the election. They knew all about you before the election and got their friends motivated. And there's 13,000 residents, I believe, in that yes. one community. So thank you, because you do what you say you're going to do. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And my question is related to the recent NLRB um, overturn, basically, of the appointments that the uh, Supreme Court basically turned down. I'm curious, does that have any bearing on what happened with you and Boeing in South Carolina and any other union issues that you're facing? Well, and that's a great question, because before um, the NLRB decided to sue Boeing. No one knew who they were. South Carolina made sure that we never forget again who the NLRB is. So I will tell you that basically what happened, just to re recap and remind you, um, the NLRB sued Boeing when they decided to create a thousand jobs in South Carolina. We were ecstatic. We desperately needed those jobs. We were trying to get back on our feet. Keep in mind, when they created those thousand jobs in South Carolina, they created 2,000 jobs in Washington State. Not a single person was hurt. Yet the NLRB went and sued this great American company. We got loud because we said, if you can do this in a right-to-work state, who's ever going to go to a non-right-to-work state? This wasn't about South Carolina. This was about the country. And so we got loud, and the rest of the country got loud with us. And those 1,000 employees that we fought for in Boeing, I am proud to say, are now 8,000 non-union employees today in South Carolina. So the pressure of the fact that we now have 8,000 employees, the pressure of the fact that we have no unions at that Boeing plant, and the fact that they have now said they're going to start building the Dash 10s. We are building more planes in South Carolina. Boeing is over the moon happy. And the NLRB, when they tried to put those um, appointments in, you know, without having the proper approval, it was wrong. It wasn't legal, and I think they now realize we're watching. And we will watch everything the NLRB does, and we all need to do that every step of the way. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. What is your current relationship with the legislature? You know, my relationship with the legislature is, um, <laughs> It depends on the day. And I will tell you that, you know, I have a Republican House and I have a Republican Senate, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have a Republican state. We understand. Um, and I will tell you that I want a conservative House and a conservative Senate, and we've had to fight very hard for that. Um, we have really worked hard to get the legislature to understand we're going to call them out when they do something wrong. You know, uh, an ori originally when I was in the House, I fought them and asked them to have to show their votes on the record because they were not. So they are now doing that. This past year, um, we fought hard to make them have to disclose their income and let us see all that they were doing. They actually, my Republican House and Senate, voted themselves a pay raise this past year. 
Um, so we vetoed that and decided to tell the people of South Carolina what they did, and we won that veto. So they're not real happy with me right now. But you know, the goal with leadership is to remember it's not about what party it is. And that's what bothers me about D.C. right now. I'm frustrated with both Republicans and Democrats in D.C. It's, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And we have to get back to the country that does things, that accomplishes things. And so for my legislature, yes, you know, I want to always work with the Republicans, but if they step out of line, I'm going to call them out on it. And if they stop working, I'm going to tell them they have to stay. And that's the key that we need to start seeing, not in only in every state, but in the country. You're there to do a job, and a party doesn't give you cover. A party is just as transparent as anything else, and there's a responsibility when you have that party. And every Republican elected official has to remember that we are conservative. We are the party of small government. We are the party that cares about rights and freedoms and protecting those. And so that's where my passion is. That's what I'll keep doing. I will continue to try and work with my legislature, but it's more importantly that I work for the people of South Carolina. Thank you all very much. God bless you.